All you. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really just so happy to be here. Now I'm going to take a risk, as women in cybersecurity we often do, so bear with me. Ani isha she'ovedet b'cyber eskrim shana. Wait, wait, wait. Rega, rega. Ani lo kotev ekod, ein li ka'akua, ve'ani lo loveshet kapuchan. Okay? Is that cool? So what did I say for my American friends? Um, I'm a woman in cybersecurity for 20 years, but I don't write code, I don't have a tattoo, and I don't wear a hoodie. So if we... This is your final one. Uh, back to this one. Thank you. Okay. So if we were to do a web search, this is what we see. This is even what you see when you type cybersecurity professional. Um, you definitely see a man in a hoodie. Um, and maybe if you're lucky, you see a very nice looking, earnest young man, um, but you definitely see men more than you see women. So our image is a problem when we talk about diversity. Um, and when we in the United States talk about cybersecurity, we're on average talking about a 43 year old white man. So uh, very briefly in our time here today, these are the points I'm gonna go over um, about how we can work together to address some of this. Now, I know in Israel things might be just a little bit different, so bear with me. This is a very US-centric uh, framework. Now, this website, cyberseek.org, um, demonstrates in this heat map the open positions in the United States. So currently, there's about 300,000 open cybersecurity positions. But maybe you have curiosity about what kind of work do these people do? What kind of job titles? Where do you enter the field from? If you visit cyberseek.org, you can learn quite a bit about this. You can see job requirements, um, and you can also see information that comes from my organization, from NICE. So let me briefly introduce myself. As you heard, Marion Merritt, um, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. We've been around since about 2014. We're part of NIST, as you heard. Um, and we work on more than education, we work on the entire workforce environment. How are we going to get more people, men, women, you know, into this field? And we are a public-private partnership. We work with government, academia, industry to solve this problem together. So um, let me just go forward. We have a couple of strategic goals that guide our work. Um, the first is we need to move much more quickly. I mean, at the moment, when people go to apply for a job, they're told, you need a bachelor's degree, you need a master's degree, you need five, ten years' experience. We don't have time. We need to move people through more quickly um, to get people qualified. The second goal is on diversity, and of course, that's why we're here today. We need more than the 10%, 12% women in cybersecurity, but we also need the same for computer sciences. Um, the numbers are just simply too low. We also need more diversity in general. So we're looking at our veteran community. We're looking at um, people with disabilities, maybe parents that want to re-enter the workforce. There's a lot of interesting opportunities. The third goal is to guide career development and the workforce planning. Because it's not clear to people, how do you get a job in cybersecurity? Where do you enter? Now, I know in Israel, a lot of people have a well-trod path. You go into the army, 8200, and you know, go to a startup, become a millionaire, hang out with Gil Shred. I understand. Um, we don't have this model in the United States, so we have some work to do. So here's the work that we're doing at NICE. You saw the heat map as one example of a project from us to help people understand jobs and how you get them. We have a workforce framework so that we can start standardizing how we describe the work that we all do. Now, cybersecurity jobs, you hear people say, what is cybersecurity? What's a cybersecurity job? You can be a lawyer, you can be a business person, you can be an analyst, you can be an engineer, you can be software development, that's all cybersecurity, right? So we need a standardized lexicon. We also have a number of conferences, and let me just say, I brought some material, I'll put it at the back of the room, um, so that you can take it with you and learn more. And we just hope that you'll join our work. So, there was a presidential order very quickly. It was last year. We worked on this as a team. The report just came out from us, and we're in commerce, and also Homeland Security, with some s distinct recommendations about what we can do to get more people into the industry. And one of the key recommendations around getting more women, veterans, and minorities 
also included suggestions for more funding for teachers and faculty, but also expanding existing programs like apprenticeships, co-ops, and internships, providing those on-ramps for people to get into the field. Um, the Department of Commerce on their own also was looking at how we can work better internationally. So quickly, here's a case study. If we look at how women were working in the industries of medicine, law, physical science, and computer science, from the 1970s on, we were all tracking as industries together. But then about the mid-80s, the red line of computer science goes like a ski slope downhill. And there's a lot of theories as to what may have happened at that time. Now, think back to mainframe days. When people were working with computers, their work environment trained them. You would show up and they'd say, we have this big IBM or this DAC or whatever it was, and you would go get educated and trained by your employer. But with the advent of the PC, of course, there was more of an expectation you would teach yourself. So that big change, not very helpful for women in this field. Accenture did this study and said, how are we going to turn this around? They made it very clear um, that what we need to do is we need to talk to girls, young girls, in the elementary school, in junior high. We need to make sure that it's fun, that they get gaming experience, because gaming is a great on-road into these fields. Um, and that means we need to engage the teachers and the parents as well. So let me just take a quick look at media. You heard a little bit about the role it played in Karen's life. So from the mid-80s on, uh-oh, there we go. We start to see boys, boys, uh-oh, same picture. Okay, so we start to see girls, positive role models. Um, this brings us here to today. The point being that um, role models and the media has a big place to play in how we explain to girls what's possible for them. Um, so let's talk about something called the Scully effect. Anybody heard of this? Does anybody know who Scully is? Okay, excellent. See, this is, these are my people. All right, so people for a long time had said that they had heard that women in STEM found Dana Scully from TV's The X-Files to be their role model. So there is a think tank called the Gina Davis for the actress, because she works on a Gina Davis uh, Media Institute. They said, we're going to research this. And they talked to women in STEM, and they found indeed that two-thirds of women in STEM careers today say that Dana Scully was a role model. So media is playing a pretty important role, and we definitely have work to do here. So towards building career awareness with young students, you need to have awareness and interest to choose a career. Um, when we talk to parents and say, you know, how does a child become a lawyer? Oh, they can tell you. But if you do the same for cybersecurity, parents are not ready to have that conversation. When you talk to millennials, um, only 9% were even interested in cybersecurity, even when they knew someone who was a practitioner. Um, and we know globally that young women are just rejecting these careers. But if we don't get to them by the end of high school age, you know, 17, 18, we've missed it. We've missed that window. What I found also very interesting is that teachers tend to tell boys more than girls that computer science, we'll use that as a, an example for cybersecurity, that boys should go into it a little bit more than girls. So, you know, 36% uh, of teachers will tell a boy, 26% will tell a girl. But look at the parents, it's even worse. 46% of parents will tell a boy, computer science would be good for you, but 26% will tell a girl. So I feel like we have some work to do on our parent community, which would be people like me, um, just to make them more aware of these great careers and how people can get into them. So here are just a few examples of programs that are aimed at young girls in the United States. Um, there are many more. There's some exciting things happening with Girl Scouts because of the work Palo Alto Networks has done. But we need more classes. We need more teachers. Um, thinking about AP courses, which are our advanced, you get college credit for classes you take in high school. In computer science, only 27% of the kids who took it two years ago were girls. So we have work to do there. Um, there's other models uh, to give examples of here. Let me give you a case study. Harvey Mudd College. Anyone ever heard of Harvey Mudd? It's a very small STEM-focused school in California. The pink line are female graduates in computer science. And they said, why are we below the national average? In 2007, they were only at 6%. You want me to finish up? Yeah, OK. So really quickly, they did some work on this. They got more female teachers to be role models and really worked on it and turned it around. So this is really wrapping up here. How we hire people makes a big difference. 
If you have an employee referral program in the United States, that means your 43-year-old white man is going to hire more 43-year-old white men. Think about job ads and gendered language that can turn women off. And then the lean-in issue. If you just load up too many requirements on the job ad, women will self-select out unless we work with them. And then could you possibly train for the roles that you have, which we do see to great effect at companies here in Israel like Checkpoint, but in uh, internationally companies like AT&T are doing that as well. Very quickly. I saw this in Jane Franklin's book. It's an, a Harvard Business Research study that if you only put one woman in the finalist pool for a job, you will not increase the number of women you hire. But when you get past the unicorn in your candidate pool and get two and three, you dramatically impact the number of women that are hired for these jobs. Okay, so what you can do is join us in our work. As I said, I brought brochures. You can get them on your way out. Work in your community. Talk to the parents. Talk to the teachers. If you have employees, send them to teach. And review and address diversity in your own world. And if you're somebody who hires or brings in speakers, try to avoid the dreaded mantle, you know, the panel that's all men. Um, and make sure that you're creating entry-level opportunities, which will be good for men and women alike. Okay, so thank you all very much for your time today.